All right. Mary, can you still hear me? Yep. Cool. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the first WebMaker call of 2013. Uh, the Etherpad for today's call, if you haven't found it already, is at etherpad.mozilla.org slash January 8th. That's capital J-A-N-0-8. Gunnar is on vacation today, so I will be your humble uh, MC. And before we dive into the agenda, just want to direct people's attention to line uh, 67 and just pause for a sec to see if there's any first timers joining today's call who want to say a quick hello. Um, you can either say hello in chat as, or on the Etherpad as Pascal just did. Welcome Pascal. Uh, or you can hit star 7 to unmute and say a quick hello now. Anybody want to say hello before we get started? Cool. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's push ahead. So I'll direct people's attention to line 100 in the agenda. And Ryan, I think you wanted to welcome us uh, back and say a few words. So Ryan, are you there? Star 7 to unmute. I am here and I am unmuted. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and just welcome everybody back after we all had a nice break. Uh, also to welcome Pascal who is a uh, guest here uh, joining us today. Um, we got some pretty big plans for this year. You guys have seen a couple of presentations and the, and the most recent board slides uh, from Mark. Um, and uh, we've got a few people in some new roles as we're growing really fast uh, both in our community and in our staff. Um, and I just I kind of wanted to share a couple of thoughts that I had over the over the last two weeks as we've been on a break, uh, and maybe just kind of kick us off with uh, with a welcome. So, you know, I think I think this year we've got a pretty incredible opportunity. Um, we have together over the past year year and a half built something that is really exciting, it is powerful, and it's unique. Um, and we've got a growing community of mentors, uh, and we've got new users trying WebMaker every single day. Uh, and a growing online community from you know, hundreds of thousands of people on our mailing list to our social media community that's growing super fast to our mentor community that is full of excited, engaged, active people who are doing great things every day. And this is a year that we want to take it even further. Um, we want to bring thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of people to become web makers, to see themselves as people who are making the web every day and expressing their creativity and innovation online. Uh, and we want to build, in addition to that, a global movement of makers. And we want to be a part of that larger contingent where Mozilla is one key player amongst you know, hundreds of organizations that are building that, that uh, you know, future of the web that we all believe in. Um, we've already started some of that with the summer code party that we ran last year that was an amazing event, um, and the UK campaign partnership that we launched at MozFest. Uh, and so I just want to start this year off by just saying you know, the, the hope that I have for all of you and, and, and a you know, commitment for myself that um, you know, we want your ideas and your inspiration and your leadership in this project. And I'm really excited that you're all here uh, and looking forward to, to having you step in. And, and that's the invitation and the call to action is that we, we really want to hear from you and not just be here, but be in bugs be organizers of events, be advocates for the things you're passionate about and the directions that you want this organization to go. That's the beauty of an open source project like this. We work in the open so that you can step in in all the various places uh, and contribute actively and steer the project. Um, you know, I want you to be outspoken and demanding. Let's push ourselves to make something great uh, that people love, and let's inspire each other with our creativity and in our, in our innovation. Um, and let's also support each other. Um, this is hard work, and especially to do in communities. Like, let's not pretend uh, this is anything but difficult. There are personalities, there are time zones, there are passions, but we're all equal to the task. Uh, and I think we have some amazing people on this team. Um, so trust your colleagues, uh, and let's all help them get better. Uh, I'm super excited for this year. I think this will be, uh, uh, you know, an amazing year for Mozilla, and I think it'll be an amazing year for WebMaker. And I just wanted to open the call with that. Uh, I want to thank you all for your work so far, and I'm pretty excited for what's to come. Go team. Very cool. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan or anybody else want to kind of chime in on the 2013 front? Cool.
Cool. It's maybe a good segue into the next item on line 110 around the mentors piece in particular. Lauren and Michelle have spent some time talking with some webmaker uh, mentors and have some key learnings under line 110. So Lauren and Michelle, do you want to take us through those? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh -oh. Yes, you can. Oh, yay. Okay. Um, yeah, so as many of you know, in 2013 we're going to be focusing a lot of energies in on the mentor community and to better prepare us for this task and to sort of help us understand what mentors need and want, a few of us did a bunch of calls uh, with a bunch of different movers and shakers that are already in our community and we talked to them about their experiences over the past year. Um, we took notes on each of the interviews and then collectively reviewed all of the responses to pull out overarching themes. And what we have learned uh, was I put into a blog post uh, a couple of days ago, which Matt has graciously summarized here in the Etherpad. Um, and we've also updated the slash teach wiki page, which is on line 127. Um, so one of the things that really stood out during this exercise is that the webmaker mentor community is really an intersection of makers in interested in learning and educators interested in making. So those two groups are situated in a larger maker movement and a larger learning movement. Um, there's plenty of people out there that are interested in the work we've been doing, which you all know. Um, but there are also people that we have to help we have to help them understand how exactly they are kindred spirits. Um, so we're going to try and do that next year. Uh, along with the community, we're going to be creating and testing ideas for web making and learning. Uh, we're going to design a sort of GitHub for learning stuff where mentors can read and rip and remix and repost learning activities, resources, guides, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll also be creating and running campaigns and train the trainer workshops. And finally, we'll be providing moral support and advice to people, for example, the Mozilla reps running the Gen Open project, um, and others who are interested in running their own webmaker projects and programs outside of, of what the core webmaker product does. Um, and we'll be helping people who want to start high learning networks in their own cities. Um, what else should I say? Uh, yeah, we're going to help various mentors find each other, um, either because they're in the same general location or because they have something in, in common. Um, so I encourage all of you to read the blog post and take a look at the slash teach wiki pages which have been updated with a really pretty graphic that Michelle made. Um, and you can help your friendly neighborhood community team by giving us feedback and thoughts and opening up discussions on the topic in the webmaker list. Cool. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm just taking in Michelle's awesome <laughs> mentor community mountain climbing graphic on line 140. That's very cool. Um, well, I wonder if uh, folks have specific questions about some of the key learnings that came out of those 80 interviews under line 137. Um, you can either just uh, crash in the pad or does anybody have any um, questions about what we learned? Um, this is Michelle uh, T. Um, I just wanted to call out one of the points that um, was a big aha for us doing this interview, which, which is what um, Laura ha has on is point number two on line 148, um, that uh, people were, were saying um, that they felt, you know, they felt that what WebMaker was doing was uh, was kindred, um, and they um, they liked it, but they didn't know what our like ethos offering was. Um, and and I think as we get you know as we start to do like kick ass products and kick ass projects, I think surfacing um, this ethos is um, continues to be a really important thing and continues to be the place where we can make um, what we do a big tent so that people who aren't necessarily using our tools but doing using um, kindred approaches and kinder technology um, can be a part of it. So I just thought that that was a really um, helpful point. 
Michelle, when you say like eth I'm not sure what Ethos offering means. Is it is it primarily just really telegraphing to people that this is a big tent that we want to build with them, as opposed to just like a product that Mozilla is shipping and that you can consume? Like, is it is it the big tent point that maybe isn't coming across strongly enough? Um, so I, th I think there's two aspects, and, and others probably have stuff to add. So I think there's both that WebMaker as a product and as a tool set is big tent, and that also that we WebMaker itself is part of a larger making is learning movement or making is learning effort, and we have this. Um, nomenclature that we're starting to use, which is a North Star, a guiding principle that making, making is learning um, is a principle that guides our work, and WebMaker is just part of that um, larger effort. And so um, how WebMaker is a big tent, but also this making is learning movement or efforts are a big tent, um, and that we're just, we're just playing in that larger field. Um, I hope maybe that's a useful <laughs> next layer edit. No, it makes sense, and it kind of overlaps with the uh, question about the first, the first point, like the making is learning narrative, which is um, like it seems like one of the questions mentors have is like, what's in scope, and is does my thing mm -hmm. fit? Um, and I guess I, I think that's interesting. I'm not, I'm not sure whether we ourselves have. I mean, I think we have clarity around what's in scope, but it seems like maybe mentors don't. I mean, I guess at first blush, we would probably say, well, anything that has to do with our kind of open values and spirit and something to do with the web and digital literacy. But are there folks who have projects that really don't really have a digital component that are wondering whether they fit within WebMaker? Yeah, that's a, I think that's a valid question. And I think part of the next um, few weeks, months of of conversations and you know hacking and discussing this in the open is is coming up with a clear sense of what's in scope. So I, I mean I think you're right. Like what you've summarized is where we're, we're where we start to see like this taking place. Um, and without being too like premature about saying exactly what's what's there, I think that's going to be one of the pro one of the outcomes of kind of the on ongoing next few months of conversation. I don't know if, if Chris or Laura, if you guys want to. Add to that one. No, I think you said it pretty well. <laughs> Very cool. And I, I was also um, really interested to see your like point number three in line 165. So, is this coming from mentors who have a kind of keen interest in like coaching or teaching people, but maybe haven't done it before? So they feel sort of confident on the tech side but need yes. help with sort of the soft skills of, of mentoring for the first time? Yeah, I think that that's a, a big part of it. Um, we have a lot of people who are you know, passionate open sourcers and passionate technologists and they want to get involved in their communities and they want to start running events, but they just don't feel really confident about teaching. Um, and you know we're working under the assumption that actually anybody can run an event and anybody can teach. So we want people are asking us how how do I do that? How do I get confident to stand up in front of a room of you know 30 kids and and share something with them if I've never mm -hmm. done it before? So we want to you know I'm, we're not thinking that we'll cr we'll create a bunch of resources, but there are resources out there, and we can we can curate a library of resources that are good. And then that second point on line uh, 167, this is really about solving our own problem. A lot of us we go to events and we always make a new slide deck. Well, I don't do that anymore, but some people do. Um, so sharing those resources that we all use so that other people can use them as well, and having them in, in one place so that they're easy to find and easy to filter would be really helpful for those people that aren't as close to the, the WebMaker project as, as most of us are. So um, this is Chris Lawrence. I'm going to jump in really quick. Um, and I, I'm blown away. I'm blown away by the, 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 the data and what the, the people doing these interviews, both Michelle, Rebecca, and Laura, we were able to glean from this, which I think just as a process point is a real a learning moment for us, you know, regardless of even of what it unearthed. Um, but I think what's really interesting about the the learning slash mentor community stuff that we've been realizing as 
as we've started to come together as a team and start to plot our vision for, for 2013 and beyond is, a, and, and the graphic that, um, that we've been working on and Michelle put into the mountain motif um, really articulates is that it's not just that people need to know how to, to mentor or, or are thirsting for the sort of soft skills or even hard skills of how to basically to, to work as a teacher and, and to understand learners, but we really have a, a unique opportunity on, on sort of two angles, right? So, you know, we also have beginning to really activate communities of people that know how to be mentors and know how to teach that are involved in some deep aspect of their lives, professional or amateur, in teaching and that also want want the, 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 the harder skills about what is digital literacy and digital skills and, and, and to learn coding for themselves and to know how to, to mesh that into their teaching. And then we have it from the other side, you know, this sort of kindred tech where we, what they've been, with Laura's just been articulating that, that they want those skills wrapped around what skills they have, whether it's, it's hacking or coding or design or, de, or, or web development, what have you. And that we really have a unique opportunity to kind of bookend these two deep desires from large activated populaces and bring them together into this one community and then where then those skills and training cross pollinate between these two large constituencies. And so that's really where I think we have a lot of excitement about this year. And I, I, I do think it's important to say that we also have large swaths of people who actually have those mentoring skills and are willing sort of almost in a transactional way trade those kind of experiences for, you know, the get back about what it is to interact with and design technology. So I think that's really where, you know, that that cross hatch of, of of those two communities that we've worked with in twenty twelve and are now looking to stitch together is a is a real excitement point. And I think um, you know, what they've been able to unearth here um, really tells a story from that sort of the, from that techie hacker part. And then the hive work, um, you know, has really drumming up and, and, and starting to understand what that desire is from sort of communities that know how to mentor but want these other skills. Very cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, anybody else with um, thoughts or questions? I guess just one quick wrap up on the um, on the interview front. Like um, we just re we really appreciate all the 80 people who took the time to to chat with us and. Um, and coming out of that, we realized that having um, having the chance to sit down with people one on one and talk um, about what they're up to and how we can support that and where we might have shared vision was like really useful. Um, and so I think one of the takeaways was to do more community inter interviews and maybe to get a bit more systematic about it because um, there's a lot of people we wanted to talk to that we just didn't have time to. Um, and so if there's people who in this round definitely want to have a chat with us. Laura and I and others are, are happy to, to talk to you. Um, and we also want to do this more often. So you might be hearing more from us on the community interview front. That's great. And Michelle, if you could maybe just post some of those details under how to get involved on line 199. So if you're a mentor or want to be a mentor and have feedback, maybe you could just um, document there how people can get involved. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very cool. Well, let's uh, push ahead to line 202. We've got uh, a demo uh, from Toby Shackman, who's one of our brand new mint newly minted Open Art Fellows. Um, if you want to follow Toby's Pixel Shaders demo, you can just click on the link in line 204. Um, that's Mozilla slash screen share, and just enter any name when, when prompted. Um, Toby, are you there? Star seven to unmute. Hello, am I here? You are here. Welcome. Good. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, um, so I I spoke about uh, this project actually a few months ago at one of these webmaker calls. Um, so, um, I'm excited to be part of this new um, iBeam Mozilla project. And uh, yeah, I wanted to give just sort of a quick tour of what I've been working on and then uh, 
bring up a few things that I feel like um, you guys could maybe help me with in terms of uh, stuff you've learned with the WebMaker, all of the WebMaker umbrella projects. Um, so I'll get started. Um, yeah, you can either follow the screen share or uh, most of this stuff is just online at pixelshaders.com. So um, I am writing an interactive book called Pixel Shaders, which is about programming the GPU, the graphics processor on the computer. Um, and there's sort of three main ideas for this project. The first idea is that I think that the next generation of programmers should be learning how to um, do parallel programming at the same time as they're learning the traditional sequential programming. Um, so, you know, traditional programming is like uh, sort of inspired by the CPU model where you you write code and it's line by line and the code gets executed one line after another and uh, this is what everyone learns for your you know your first programming class and probably the first few years of programming and uh, the problem is that it's really not the future of programming because uh, you know processors can't get any faster without using up a lot of heat and energy and uh, the just the world in general is moving towards having lots and lots of computers rather than single fast computers. Um, so the next generation of programmers should be learning how to do this um, parallel programming thinking. Uh, the second big idea is that uh, the target audience for this book is artists rather than sort of traditional programmers. So um, I think a lot of um, so so one issue is that just uh, I mean traditional programmers can enjoy this book, but I'm hoping to make it accessible to people who have never programmed before. Um, and then finally, the third idea is that the book is interactive. So um, you can read more about all of these ideas on the proposal page. Um, but the interactiveness is mostly with live coding. So all of the examples are live coded, so I could, um, you know, change these numbers around and uh, see see the results in real time. Um, the idea of pixel shaders is that this stuff runs on the GPU using WebGL, so um, this new browser technology that lets me run um, GPU code directly on the GPU. Um, this lets me do all sorts of interesting effects. Um, basically, the way you can think of a pixel shader is just that it's um, every single pixel is an independent computer. So um, the pixels can know their position and then change their color based on what their position is. They can also know, for example, the time and then make interesting sort of graphics based on that. The code tends to be pretty short for these types of things. Um, it's, it's more about orchestrating all of these individual computations to produce an effect rather than writing a long bunch of code where you're managing state and control flow and things like this that you would in traditional programming. Um, each pixel can also sample from textures. So for example, you can sample from the webcam, um, which we can do with these new technologies. Hello, this is me. Um, and then by sampling from the webcam, they can also um, you know, sample from different pixels and do you know your standard sort of photoshoppy like filters and uh, so I think this is sort of an interesting thing that we can now do on the web and uh, I think people could get excited about making these sorts of things and I'm hoping that artists sort of uh, take up this stuff but as of now um, the issue with this is that uh, most WebGL stuff is pretty inaccessible I think to beginner programmers, um, they sort of expect, most learning resources expect that you're already a competent programmer and probably also have worked with C before. Um, so this book that I'm working on is starting really from the basics and has these um, 
this like exercise structure. So there's not. Um, hopefully, there won't be a lot of text, but actually, most of the learning will happen through interactive exercises, um, where you have to sort of solve these problems, and it, and they get sort of trickier and trickier. Um, where you have to like, oh, okay, well, I have to make this zero, and then I have to make this that. Uh, and then you get more problems, and uh, um, so most most people so far the feedback I've gotten is that uh, most people are able to get through this, even people who have never programmed before. Um, sometimes they get stuck near the end on on this particular problem. Um, but then what I'd like to do is, in addition to writing the content for the book and writing the exercises, is I'd like to um, make tools to help people understand sort of what's going on. So um, this this graphing tool I think is going to be very important. So um, you know I can I can write oops. I can I can see these graphs. These become very important when you're uh, writing this type of code. Um, and uh, in addition, there's this sort of interface that breaks down what's happening. So um, one of the issues with with these pixel shaders is you know when you read some source code, uh, you know you you get to something like like this, and you're like, well, what exactly does that line of code do? Um, but then the nice thing about an interface like this is that it sort of breaks it down step by step so you can see how the code was built up. So it's like X, and then we did this operation to, to repeat it, and then we subtracted 1, and then we took the absolute value, and then we sort of shuffled it around like that. Um, so I'm building I'm building um, various interactive tools that I think will help people understand this type of code even. Um, so, so basically, I'm trying to fuse um, sort of the analytical thinking that you have to do to do like symbolic math and to write traditional code with spatial thinking. So um, trying to both get traditional programmers to think more spatially, but then get people who think spatially, like artists, to also think analytically and sort of fuse these two ways of thinking together so that people are comfortable moving back and forth between them. Uh, and I'll show one more thing in here. Um, I'm also building this interface that I can sort of sample any pixel. So you, you can see as I move this mouse, the uh, on the right hand side the position variable is changing and then you can see how that um, sort of goes through the code. So um, I guess things that I would be interested in um, getting feedback on is uh, how to um, so first of all, this is going to be like a, a book length project, I think, and so I want some way for people to be able to save their progress and sort of keep a like a lab book or a project book of everything that they've created so they can refer back to it and also just on the practical side, you know, know where they are in the book and which exercises they've solved. So I was wondering if anyone's worked on any systems that uh that do stuff like that. Um, and then also ways for sharing the code. So um, in addition to the exercises, I want there to be sort of just more open ended projects like you know at the you know after you've learned the gradients and how to do that kind of thing, it'll say something like, well, uh, you know write a pixel shader about about a tunnel or something and then Someone would, you know, just be try to be inspired by certain things, or, or showing pieces of contemporary art, and then suggesting ways that people could expand on these ideas. And uh, but then I also want people to be able to share those. So you know, when you when you finished writing your pixel shader about the tunnel, or inspired by a piece of art, then you see everyone else who's done that exploratory exercise, and you see how other people interpreted the question. So. Um, 
so those sorts of things I'd like to get feedback on. Um, also, if there's a, I'm a, for for this particular thing, I'm um, I'm actually writing a GLSL interpreter in JavaScript, so sort of a geeky thing. But if anyone's interested in that, um, I would love to talk to you about that kind of stuff. Um, Very so cool. Thanks, Toby. Um, why don't we move over to to questions with a couple minutes we have have left for your item. Um, and actually, I've, I've started a placeholder on line 223. I know you mentioned there's some a couple specific items you're looking for specific feedback on. So if you could just kind of mm -hmm. list them there for folks. Um, but I, I think uh, there's a question on line 229 um, about whether there might be opportunities to get some of Pixel shaders into into WebMaker and whether there's potentially a good kind of first timer project or um, you know unit of making that would help people produce something with pixel shaders that's kind of cool and shareable quickly. Um, so I, well, I don't know if you have any thoughts there. I mean, definitely, um, it, what do you mean by quickly? Are, are you looking <laughs> for specific, specific chunks of you know, like an hour long class or, or chunks like sitting down for five minutes or, or like a four day workshop? I, I mean, just uh, uh, there's there's all sorts of things you can do, but it I think it takes time to like build up deep understanding. So um. yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, like so Emma, for example, uh, on line two thirty two, was suggesting that maybe pixel shaders would be a a, a way that kids, for example, could um, get their hands dirty in a short period of of time and produce some fun results. Just posted an example from Khan Academy on line 233. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess quickly, is there something you could make in under, say, 15 or 20 minutes as a first timer, or is Pixel Shaders a little too advanced for that? I mean, you definitely could. I mean, the thing the thing with like the Khan Academy thing, for example, is I, I don't think that. I mean, it's it's cool. It, so the immediate feedback, of of course, is great, but. Um, like the kids who really get into the Khan Academy thing, you know, they'll play with it for, you know, a six-hour stretch or something. You know, the ones who really get into it, and and that's that's where like the deep learning happens, I think. So, um, I mean, I'm hoping the the reason that I build this project as a book rather than just a website is that I'm hoping to get that sort of um, attention relationship happening. Um, where where someone's engaged with something for you know on the order of hours, um, the way that you would read a book or something, rather than the way most people just visit web pages. So sort of tricky. Cool. Well, thanks, Toby. You're getting lots of love in in Ether chat and some more um, questions and discussion happening under line uh, 228. So maybe you can kind of just keep chatting with with folks there, and I'll just direct everybody to the How to Get Involved uh, links that uh, Tebby's posted under line uh, 237 if you want to go further with pixel shaders. Um, just conscious of time, so let's, let's push ahead to line 245 and the sort of debrief and aftermath report on MozFest uh, from Michelle. Michelle, it looks like you've got sort of five key points for discussion. Um, do you want to take us through those? Uh, sure. So I had to talk a lot on this call, but um, thanks for Matt for the invite to to come on and for pasting some of this in. So I um, just wanted to share some of the a summary about um, the Mozfest 2012, which is our annual read write um, event, um, which took place in London. Um, and I think each year we learn quite a lot from it. Um, and so I definitely you know welcome you to to take a look at some of the details about how it went down and and some of the things that came out of it. Um, but for this call, I wanted to um, open up a few conversations about um, proposals for next year, because just as you finish one MozFest, you have to start preparing for the next one. And um, some of those are listed here um, starting on line 254. And so one of the first proposals I had, and maybe, maybe many of you can relate, um, is that we try to release a lot of things right before MozFest. And um, we're, we're working really heads down and shipping a lot of things, and I think that causes quite a lot of um, pressure to have things 
you know, be polished and, and there for MozFest. And so one of the proposals was um, decoupling releases from announcements. So I think we should definitely use MozFest as a place to make a big splash um, and, uh, and have people playing with you know, top tier um, tools but that the release itself, um, and I think the popcorn team did this well last year, um, have a buffer um, w so there's a chance to t like play and test uh, before MozFest. Um, so definitely chime in if you guys have thoughts um, in the Etherpad, and then we can maybe open up for, uh, for a quick chat. Um, and then another question we had was, uh, is two and a half days the right amount of time for MozFest? So I've heard um, opinions on both sides. Um, some people saying it's perfect just as it is. Mo you know, I, it's just a weekend, and they c it's easy to come to. Um, and other people saying, um, no, we just get started, just get geared up, and it'd be great to have more time, both to be hacking on things and just to be socializing. Um, more time means it costs more money to feed everyone and keep everyone overnight, but it might mean that we get more out of it. Um, so I'd love to hear people's um, opinions about the length of MOSFES. Um, and equally, I think there's a lot of interesting questions around uh, the size of MozFest. Um, at the moment, we, we have about 1,000 people who come, um, and it, I think, fills, filled the building quite nicely, and we had uh, like 180 sessions. And in general, um, I think the rooms and the sessions got filled well, and it didn't feel overcrowded or under-attended. Um, but if we want to have more people there, it means we have trade-offs on maybe venues or other sorts of formats and things like that. Um, so I'd love to hear what people think about, about size. Um, and maybe one thing to counterbalance the size question is um, looking at how um, smaller regional activities can be a way for people who aren't able to come to one to London or wherever they might be in the future, um, and to do something in their community around the same time or before, it, and feel like it's it's connected. Um, and so these can be if we do mini moss fests in different places, they can be smaller, they can be um, less daunting to put on. It can be a place where we test things and 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 um, work with um, a particular places, um, and it might you know it might be a balance to this challenge of how do you grow one big annual MozFest. Um, and then the last recommendation from, from that blog post was um, this year I think we, had a, we were pretty successful um, with space wranglers. Those were um, like five or so brave souls who helped curate a range of sessions and activities around a theme. Um, and I think that like, their leadership and their um, thoughtfulness about how certain sessions tied together and, and having kind of a federated ownership of the program was really, really helpful. And one of the things I'd like to challenge us to do next year is to have um, space wranglers who are not only staff members but also community members. So um, you know, a local team, maybe through summer code parties and other things, has developed a range of activities. Um, and they can, they can come to MozFest and bring their whole team and bring a whole bunch of sessions and run kind of a community, like a, a space that's been wrangled by a community member, um, and just really like bring their best team there. And um, so that was, the, that was the, there's plenty more ideas, but I thought those would be the most useful to share. Um, cool. Matt, did you see anything that was good to respond to in this? I'm just kind of catching up on what people were saying. Mm, I've been too busy writing my own stuff. Um, <laughs> let's see whether there's specific questions that jump out. Does anybody have questions on this? I mean, this is a really good summary, Michelle. Um, anybody have questions or thoughts? There's lots of good notes coming in on the pad. Cool. Um, I'm happy to Wait, I wonder maybe if you could have say more, Michelle, about mm -hmm. the community sp space wrangler piece. I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I totally understand what you mean there. Could you just say a little uh -huh. more about that one? Sure. So um, I'll take uh, Chloe as my Chloe and Michelle Levesque as my brave examples of 
Um, they were they're, uh, MOFO staff members who wrangled a space last year, which basically meant we had a track around hackable games. Um, you know, Chloe contacted the um, session organizers, helped stitch it together, helped make sure that that space really flowed, and then both her and Michelle were on deck to kind of support the sessions as they ran, um, and to think about how the sessions could interact with one another. Um, so they, they hosted a, that space or they wrangled a space around a particular topic. And the idea with the community space wranglers is that um, I think there's a huge opportunity um, like people who are running you know, hives in different cities like Hive Athens, or people who are maybe running like, I don't know, an open news community somewhere or whatever, um, might actually have a pool of local talent and activities that they've developed and tried um, over the course of the year that they bring to MozFest and in a similar way host um, not just one session, but maybe a space or a several series of sessions that stitch together as, a, as kind of a larger experience. Um, and so that's one way I'd, I'm kind of excited to grow the festival program. Um, so maybe that makes makes a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. Does anybody have thoughts on that or any of the other um, kind of discussion threads before we push ahead? Um, so the, there's, a, there's a question under other feedback on line 303. This is a question about um, like moving MozFest to different cities to, to build more global community. Do we have a, a theory, Michelle, about where next year's festival is going to be? Um, and, and what do you think about this idea of um, explicitly trying to move it around to build global community? So it, it's got it up, it's up and down, and I love to hear what people, if they propose other cities, what they would, why they would propose them, and why, or when why they would propose them. So when Moss Fest started, when it was the first the Drumbeat Festival, the idea was that they would change and be in different cities each year. Um, but once we did one in London, and it worked more or less well, we decided we've. We, it's, it, you get a lot of value out of actually understanding a space, understanding a city, um, taking time to build up relationships in a place, having um, organizing team members who can be a bit of a veteran and, and know how it works so that you cut down on the, um, the organizational headache of making, um, making a big event like this happen. Um, I do know it comes at the cost of, uh, bringing, like, of putting a spotlight on a new area and, and new partners and stuff like that. And London isn't the cheapest city, um, nor is it the only exciting city in the world. Um, so I do think it has its pros and cons, um, which is another reason why I think this, the mini Moss Fest idea might be interesting as a way to say, maybe this year, I don't know, we'll, we'll pick Athens because they're nice. Maybe this year we don't have a Moss Fest in Athens, but we do a mini activity there. Um, see how it goes, see what traction is, and maybe it becomes a conversation whether you know, 2014 or something, you do, you do a larger event there. Um, but there's definitely a lot of kind of learning <laughs> when you, when you, and like logistics and stuff that go on, which is one of the reasons why we've, we've kept it there. And, and plus, we have an office and lots of good partners and staff, and it just felt, it just felt right. So <laughs> um, that's why it's been in London for a while. Cool. Well, thanks, Michelle. Um, well, let's, let's push ahead. Um, and I'm conscious we've got about 12 minutes left. Um, so Ben Simon, more frequent Mozilla emails in 2013. Um, if you could shave a couple minutes off so we can <laughs> make sure we have enough time for the last two items, that'd be, that'd be great. But let's, let's start over to Ben. Ben, what's up with Mozilla emails in 2013? Star 7 to unmute. Ben, are you there? Going once. Going twice. We will circle back to you. Let's push ahead to line 353. Night Mozilla Fellows onboarding in 2013. Dan Sinker, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that 
uh, over at Open News, we're hitting 2013 running. Uh, Eric is already in Boston. I'm en route to Boston uh, a little later today. And we have all eight of our 2013 Knight Mozilla Fellows either in the air or getting ready to get in the air to converge on the MIT Media Lab this week. Um, one of the things that uh, we learned coming out of the fellowships last year was there was a great deal, uh, a, a big benefit in bringing our fellows together. And um, we didn't actually have a chance to bring them all together uh, last year until about halfway through, uh, well, not halfway, but, but uh, early summer of last year. And so one of the things in thinking about how we, um, how we tweaked the fellowship this year was to uh, bring all the fellows together uh, right at the start before any of them have actually begun uh, at their newsrooms. So they have a chance to really get to know each other and most importantly to really begin to work with each other. Um, we also saw an opportunity to uh, have everyone together and uh, get over some uh, nuts and bolts stuff, you know, how to file expenses and things like that, uh, but also to really bring uh, a learning component in as well. So we've structured a really interesting week. Uh, tomorrow uh, we do a lot of nuts and bolts. We have some of our uh, 2012 fellows in to talk about what, uh, how they uh, worked with their year. We have some of our news partners in to give a little bit of a sense of the history of, of developing in the newsroom as well as, well as their uh, hopes for their fellows. Um, things really kick off on Thursday when we actually go to the Boston Globe and we work with um, two, uh, two folks from the uh, product development shop, IDEO, uh, who are going to lead the fellows in uh, some lessons on how to do need finding and how to do uh, observational uh, understanding of, of what needs are within an organization, uh, and then also train them on rapid prototyping. So they're able to uh, work through some ideas very quickly in the newsroom itself. Uh, we'll then go to uh, Boston on, uh, or sorry, back to the MIT Media Lab on Thursday and Friday where the fellows really get a chance to hack together and, uh, and make some stuff that they started to prototype on on Thursday. So uh, we're really looking forward to it and just wanted to let everyone know. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, and hopefully you can do maybe a bit of a report back and, and uh, share some photos and blog posts, et cetera, in next week's call. Absolutely. Sweet. Thank you, sir. Uh, looks like Ben has sorted his tech issues. Ben, are you there? I believe so. Am I there? You are here. All right. Um, excellent. Thanks, everyone. Um, so just in case you uh, didn't feel like you were getting enough emails from us um, in the last month, uh, I have a plan to send a few more, though generally um, fewer of them being fundraising. Um, the basic idea here is that I think we've done some things well uh, over email in the last year and some things less well. And the thing we've done less well is to actually tell a good long-term story about all the awesome stuff we do. Um, and there's a few reasons for that, and I sort of went into it in the blog post that's linked on line 312. Um, but the, and I'm happy to talk about this more with anyone who's interested, um, but the basic idea is I want to start sending sort of roughly weekly um, emails that are a bit shorter, um, kind of like if you think about the way some orgs do big newsletters with lots of items, this would, you know, once a month or something like that. The idea here would be to, you know, rather than that, do an email a week-ish about a single of the newsletter items um, as a, a way to sort of not be stuck into that format, which can often lead to lead you down a not awesome road. Um, but the basic idea is to do that. And I've got a few sort of potential avenues of, like, what could be good ideas, started on line 321. Um, but I would love your help. Um, and there's a, there's a link on line 347 for places to submit ideas. Um, I'd also be happy to talk to anyone if you sort of want to get your project in the stream. Um, we right now got about 600,000 subscribers. Um, and there's a few different sort of ways we could break that down, um, start, which are broken out on line 316. Um, if there's something that's sort of a bit more niche, it doesn't make sense to go to everyone. Um, but I'd love to start uh, doing this. Um, and so if anyone has something that they'd like to get out there, let me know. 
and we will make it happen. That's that short enough, Matt? <laughs> Very nicely done. Thanks, Ben. My pleasure. Cool. Well, uh, and so, yeah, just hit, hit, me, hit me in the comments or off list or whatever. That's cool. Awesome. And, and so that link on line 351 is the right place for people to start submitting ideas, Ben? Yes. And that's also that's a, an Etherpad that Rebecca uh, put together, and it's also the place for you to submit things if you want them in other channels that we control. Um, so that is your, like, if you want us to, if you want anyone on a sort of communications angle to be getting word out about your stuff, uh, put it in there. Very cool. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, we've got one last item on line 369. Um, so maybe we will call on Henrik in just a moment. But I also wanted to, before, uh, before we run out of time, I just wanted to direct people's attention to line 387 as well because uh, we've got an upcoming Mozilla-wide fireside chat with, uh, with Mark Sermon coming up. I think that's scheduled for January 21st. Pascal, is that right? Can you correct me if I'm wrong? Um, so this is January 21st. It is. Um, so Pascal, I know you list this as nonverbal, but I don't know if we can um, coax you to say a few words about it. Uh, star 7 to unmute. Uh, sh sure thing. Let's see if this works. Um, assuming you can hear me, and I'm not like yes, uh, speaking. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so uh, a little bit of context. So uh, Mitchell and I have been, and a couple of other people, have been talking about um, the idea of exposing larger parts of our community, especially around like es essentially Mozillians, um, to more of our leadership team and have more of a a candid, frank kind of discussion where people can ask their questions and we can, ask, we can answer them in, uh, in a candid manner. Um, we're doing this at um, the corporation level with uh, Gary's um, monthly MoCo meeting, um, but we are not doing it with any other um, person in our leadership team. This includes uh, Mozilla's, uh, Mozilla Corporation Steering Committee. This includes people from the foundation like Mark, for example. Um, and it includes also the, uh, the people who are on the board of both uh, MoCo and MoFo. Um, so we've done our first one with uh, Mitchell Baker. If you haven't seen it yet, um, it's on the uh, Air Mozilla page. It's really good. It's, like, it's pretty long. It's like an hour and something. Um, we decided to uh, produce it as, a, um, as an audio file only, um, as a podcast, so you can listen to it you know, on, your, on your phone on your way to work or something. Um, so this is the second one in the, in the series, um, and this time we are, uh, we're going to interview Mark, um, which I think is, is uh, especially interesting and important um, given that uh, we learned that a lot of people, uh, especially in, in Mozilla Corporation land, um, actually have very little insight into um, what the foundation is really doing, what you guys are doing with WebMaker, um, even who Mark Sermon is, <laughs> ironically. Um, so there's a... Um, uh, there's a really nice opportunity for us to, to highlight um, the work you're doing, um, also like look critically at, um, at, at you know, questions people have, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's the short of it. Um, we're going to uh, record it in the week of Jan 21st. I think it's um, the 25th actually is, is when it is scheduled. Um, and then uh, it will take us a few days just to get it up, and it will be on Air Mozilla then. Very cool. Thank you, Pascal. And if folks have questions to add to the list, and I, and I hope you all will, there's a link on line 401. And as Mary has helpfully pointed out, it looks like it's January 25th, not January 21st. Uh, so we've made that correction in line 388. Um, let's back up the agenda uh, to line 370. Henrik, I apologize. We skipped you over. Are you there? Star 7 to unmute. Yes, I'm there. Do you hear me? Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, I hope you can still hear me. Just a quick update. Uh, the German-speaking Mozilla community met last weekend in Berlin, and basically we decided to reboot ourselves uh, and become more active or uh, active on a, on a broader scale than in the past. As you will be able to read from the notes, in the past we've been mostly active in localization and uh, support work. 
And now we uh, we have the one one uh, mission statement which we call Eine starke Gemeinschaft für das offene Internet, which means a strong community for the open internet. And we formed nine groups, one of which is WebMaker. And um, the uh, most important update is there's a Swiss guy uh, called Michael Kohler. I linked his Mozilla profile here, and he is in charge of this WebMaker community. So if there's if there's anything you would like to reach the Germ out to the German community in the WebMaker domain, Michael is your man. Uh, he is very familiar with WebMaker initiatives. He was involved uh, as both uh, as a participant as well as organizer in events. And he's currently syncing up with Michelle and Laura to make sure that uh, it's all happening in closed loop uh, communication. I, uh, he's currently working, uh, but I hope that he will be able to join future WebMaker calls as well. That's it. Thank you very much. Very cool. Thank you, Henrik. And your timing is perfect as that takes us to the end of the hour. Uh, so I, I'll direct uh, people's attention to, let's see, is there any remaining nonverbal updates? I don't think so. Some, some 2013 communications resolutions from me on line 411, but I'll send uh, a mail uh, on the WebMaker News Group with more on that. So thanks for a great call, everybody. The link to the agenda for next week's call on January 15th is on line 435. So if you've got items you want to add to the agenda, you can go ahead and do that there. Otherwise, we will talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Please stand by.